All right, so I just want to give you an example of weaponized worship in the Word, okay? And a lot of you already know it, but I always came back to this as a young Christian, and, and I had been playing guitar for a long time already when, uh, when I became a Christian. And it's right out of first, uh, Samuel 16, verse 17. It says, Saul, talking to his soldiers, was being harassed by a spirit, and he said, provide me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. Okay, so there's something even the world would say is that music calms the savage beast. Have you ever heard that one? Yeah. Remember the cartoons when you were a kid? Did you ever see the animals were just going crazy and all of a sudden they'd play a song <laughs> and, and they would calm down? What is that? Like, what is it about music that does that? It touches a different part of us. It's not our brain. It's not logic. It's somewhere way closer to our heart. And you know it's got this other factor to it because you could hear a song after 20 years and first time you hear it after 20 years you're brought back to the place you were where you have a memory with that song right there, there's a spiritual aspect to music but if it's not directed redemptively through the lord it's going to be used to destroy when you here's another one stevie winwood when you see a chance take it like if you could cheat on that guy's girl with that guy's girlfriend the door's open, go for it. That's exactly what he meant. I'm not even going to quote other ones because they're too foul. So anyway, they understood in the Bible that Saul was being harassed by a tormenting spirit. But if we could find somebody who can play anointed music, the spirit will leave. Isn't that amazing? They knew that. So then it says in verse 18, one of the servants said, Look, I've seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite who's a who is skillful in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and handsome person, and as if that wasn't enough, the Lord is with him. Wow. All he had to say was, the Lord is with him, <laughs> no matter what you look like, okay? God doesn't judge the outside package, does he? He looks at the heart. We talked about that last week, but he did have all those other attributes, and how did he, this servant, know about David, he was on the backside of a mountain. But see, the Bible says in Proverbs that your gift, you know it, will make room for you. That's Proverbs 18, 16. Your gift will make room for you and bring you before a great man. Now, that could be your natural gift of playing music, but it could also be a gift. What good timing, Brian. See, he's saying, I'm sowing into that word right now. I believe that, that my gift is going to make room. So it could also be a gift to the Lord, right? I'm not trying to manipulate anybody. I'm just saying that if you try to promote yourself and you're always out there saying, like in the beginning when we first opened the church, we would get cold calls. Uh, Minister Frank, whoever, wants to come and speak at your church. When can he come? And we're like, we don't even know you. Who are you? Can you imagine Jesus ever doing that? Hey, I'm really short on, uh, on dates. I don't have my calendar. I got to fill up my calendar, make some cold calls. What about the anointing? That's what we're looking for, not cold calls, okay? Anyway, whatever. You get my point. They knew about David, not because he tried to promote himself, because when you have talent, people know about it. When you have an anointing, people know about it. It's on your life. There's oil on your life. The oil of the anointing of the Holy Spirit comes on your life because you're in your zone. Now, clearly, David found his zone. Skillful in playing, mighty man of arrow, man of war, prudent in speech, handsome person, and the Lord is with him. That's called convergence. That's finding your zone and operating at a higher level because you're where you're supposed to be. You're in the right place at the right time. And for such a time as this, who knows? That, Esther said that. For such a time as this, that I'm in the right place at the right time, and let's see what happens. And if I die, I die. Right? And that's what David said, too. He's like, look, who is this uncircumcised Philistine shouting down the armies of God? He's going down. My worship is a weapon. David took a lyre, that was a guitar, and played it. And Saul was refreshed and became well, and the evil spirit left him. There's deliverance. That is weaponized worship. Something about the anointing on David's life. He comes in and Saul's being tormented and the spirit leaves just through the anointing. That should be a major lesson for us. Amen. I don't know what the number is right now, but I looked at it not long ago. And the number of views on YouTube for the song, uh, What a Beautiful Name by Hill Songs, was over 300 million. See, so if you don't think there's some unsafe people smuggling Jesus in in the music, you're wrong. They're not all saved. That wasn't 300 million Christians that were watching that. It's an anointed song. 
and it's, and it's penetrating the airwaves, and it's touching people's hearts, and all of a sudden they're being forced to say, I wonder what I really do believe. He says it's a weapon against the kingdom of darkness. Uh, he, he hates the anointing. The devil hates the anointing. So I mentioned that. I was going to mention Harriet Tubman, and I haven't seen the movie, but I've done enough. I know that she's being considered to be put on one of our, on our currency, the first woman that would be considered to be put on our currency. And I, I don't know why that's been delayed. It should have already happened from what I was reading. But that's quite an honor for somebody who couldn't read or write, right? And just as, as this pillar of, of a historical figure. I don't know if she later learned how to read or write. I don't know that much about her. But I do know this, that she was what they call on the Internet the conductor of the uh, Underground Railroad. You can put the next one up. There she is. Okay. And that's what it says. Harriet Tubman was the conductor of the Underground Railroad. One of the songs she taught her crew as she was trying to get them out was called Wade in the Water. It's believed that she used this traditional Negro spiritual as a way to warn slaves to get in the water to hide their scent from the slave catching dogs on their trail. Oh, I read that and I just sat back in my chair and went, oh my God, what a, what a turn of a phrase. First of all, the, the strategy of getting under the water so the dogs can't smell you, that's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's when Israel was escaping Egypt and God hid them in the cloud. So you could be walking through a tough situation, right? So it says about Jesus, he just walked through the crowd. They were ready to throw him off the mountain, but God puts a protective envelope around you. And she knew enough to say, if you get in the water and you get underwater, the, the scent won't be obvious to the dogs and you could hide. But look... Think about how she used a, a Christian song to, as a weapon in warfare to protect these people, to get them out. Uh, and I, should, I would never know what it's like to be hunted like an animal, where dogs are trying to chase me down. But what the Lord showed me is that drugs was like a slave catching dog that was on my trail. And, and, and you know, it might not be drugs. It could be other things. It could be opioids. Well, I, I, that would be a drug. But you might have started because you had an accident and you were in pain and your neck was bothering you and they prescribed prescription drugs to you, but you, you kept taking them. See, unlike me, you know, using them, uh, I won't even go why I was, never mind. Scratch that from the record. <laughs> There's a lot of slave catching dogs that are after us today. And I'm in no way demeaning what she had to go through and what these people had to go to. But what's the spiritual application? And it could be food. You know, we talked about that the last few weeks, is that we could have an unhealthy relationship with food. We know we all need it. It's legal. As Christians, we're all allowed to go out to eat together. But we have to be really careful that we have the right approach to this subject. And no way meaning being condemning, I'm just trying to expose a tactic of the enemy, is, is for us to have an unhealthy relationship with the food and use it for comfort instead of using it for nourishment. That's another lie. Jesus gives you more comfort than Ben and Jerry's. And again, no condemnation. But what about tobacco? If there was ever a slave catching dog, tobacco, it's right on the package. This product can cause cancer. And again, I'm not condemning anybody that might still be smoking, but we want to encourage you to come up for prayer and let us help you break that thing off your life. So many of us, we're not pulling rank on anybody. I was a drug addict. If Jesus didn't free me, I'd be dead. So I know it's real. But it's not just tobacco, it could be alcohol, it could be pornography as the slave catching dog. Can't stop, you try to stop, but you can't stop. That is a problem if you find yourself that you can't stop and, and you get triggered. So I, I've been talking about Russ Taff a lot and he went clean for 10 years. But then when his mother died, he got triggered. See, a profound event happens that stressed him out, and, and all that structure that he had built to stay away from the alcohol collapsed by the power of his mother dying and the fact that he hadn't forgiven her, okay? So you have to be careful that, oh, no, I don't have a problem in that area. I only use it once in a while. Well, you know, try to stop. <laughs> Just try to stop. And if you can't, that's a problem. So watch out for the triggers, too.